Um, good afternoon and welcome to Madison VA's Ho <coughs> VA Hospital's live telephone town hall. My name is Abe Rabinowitz and I'm the Assistant Director of the Hospital and I'll be moderating this afternoon's call. We are very fortunate to have a panel of Madison VA's leadership team here to answer questions. This includes our Acting Hospital Associate Director, Dr. Guadalupe Mejia, our Chief of Staff, Dr. Ryan Marsh, Dr. Chris Cernich, our Chief of Medicine and Infectious Disease, Christy Esch, our Deputy Associate Director for Patient Care Services, Liana Torres, the Chief of Patient Administration Services, Stephanie Schilling, Chief Social Work, and Chad Casey, who's our Veterans Experience Officer. We hope you stay on the line with us this afternoon and encourage you to participate in the question and answer session that will follow our updates. If you'd like to ask a question, all you have to do is press zero on your phone at any point during the call, and you'll be connected with a staff person who can take your question and get you into the queue to speak with our panel. The Q&A session will be toward the end of our call, but you can press zero now to get in the queue um, at any time. If you do get cut off, unfortunately, there's not an easy way to rejoin, so please stay on the line. Um, and we like to start uh, these telecon halls <coughs> out each time with a message um, from our leadership team. And today we have our acting hospital associate director, Dr. Guadalupe Mejia, uh, to give us that message. Dr. Mejia. Thanks, Abe, and thank you all for joining us on the call today. I'm very excited to be here in Madison to fill the associate director role for the next 90 days. I've been here only a few weeks, but I'm already impressed by the, the hospital this team has built and the exceptional culture and commitment to veterans here in Madison. I am looking forward to doing all that I can to help this team during this detail, and I'm happy to be here today to provide you with a few leadership updates. First, we want you to know that we remain in a waiting period for an announcement of the new permanent director. We want to thank Alicia Miller for her service as our acting director for 120 days, and Christine Kleckner, our permanent associate director, for her service in the role of acting director now. Ms. Kleckner is at a network leadership meeting today and regrets not being here with all of you. I'm excited that today we also have several subject matter experts on the call to share updates. We have Dr. Chris Cernich to present an update to you on the reemergence of COVID in our community and safety precautions for COVID and seasonal influenza. Christy Esch, our Deputy Associate Director for Patient Care Services, will provide a status update on our COVID vaccinations and flu shot offerings. Liana Torres, Chief of Patient Administration, will share updates on our travel reimbursement and transportation program. And Stephanie Schilling, Chief of Social Work, will comment on Suicide Prevention Awareness Month and the Compact Act. In between the presentations, we will have some poll questions for you, and we will uh, certainly make sure to allow time for your questions at the end. Thanks, Abe, and now back to you. Thank you, Dr. Mejia, and welcome to Madison. We're very happy to have you here. Um, first on our list of updates is our Chief of Medicine and Infectious Disease, Dr. Chris Cernich. Dr. Cernich was pivotal in guiding us through the most difficult days of the COVID pandemic and is here to provide us with a safety update about a recent uptick in COVID cases as we, as we approach the fall and to share safety precautions. Dr. Cernich. Thank you, Abe. Um, I think everybody on this call is probably aware that we are seeing increased numbers of COVID-19. Uh, cases. This is happening across the country, uh, and certainly we have not been speared uh, from that increased activity. We are seeing uh, market upticks in our wastewater uh, numbers over the last month that has correlated with uh, clear uptick in the number of veterans testing positive for COVID-19. And fortunately, we've only seen a mild uptick in our increased number of, of hospitalizations. And again, I think this speaks to the fact that we're in a different phase of COVID-19. Um, that being said, uh, a COVID-19 illness uh, can affect uh, at-risk individuals, particularly those uh, who are older uh, and have multiple comorbidities, either lung, kidney, heart disease, or aren't immunosuppression. Um, and conversely, um, we do see a lot of staff outages, um, which can also impact our, our operations. And so uh, I know everybody is tired of COVID-19. <laughs> I certainly am myself, um, but it is something that we need to remain aware of. So with that in mind, we have implemented 
uh, a few minor enhanced mitigations uh, in response to the increased uptake here. Um, specifically, we've increased our testing around admissions to the hospital. And if you are attending uh, a clinical appointment, you will see our staff uh, wearing masks uh, when they're in the room uh, with you. We have elected at this time not to um, go forward with more robust masking, um, recognizing that uh, that can be a challenge. It is something that we are monitoring closely, um, but at this point we don't anticipate turning back masking for everybody uh, in, in healthcare facilities. We are going to continue to monitor the situation over the next several weeks, and if disease activity starts to cool off, which we all expect it will at some point, uh, we will then uh, relax uh, our enhanced mitigations. Um, my one, uh, or I have a few bits of advice for veterans. Uh, Christy Esch is gonna be talking about vaccinations. Um, I highly recommend that veterans over the age of 65 uh, or those with uh, chronic health conditions involving lung, kidney, um, and heart, uh, as well as those who are immunosuppressed, should get the COVID-19 uh, booster. Uh, it is approved for use at all ages, but those groups are the, the, the two groups in particular that I would strongly recommend a COVID-19 booster. Uh, similarly, influenza vaccine is now available. Um, and those same uh, patient populations that I just alluded to should be um, getting their annual influenza booster. And then finally, I'd like to just make note that the FDA has approved an RSV vaccine uh, for those over the age of 60. Um, and right now, we still don't have uh, all the information on how we're gonna use that vaccine moving forward, but it's approved for individuals over the age of 60. Um, for a one-time dose at this point, it's approved with what we call a shared decision-making, meaning um, our physicians and other providers should be talking with you about the pros and cons of the RSV vaccine. And again, we will have that available. And if you're interested in getting that vaccine, please uh, talk with your uh, provider. I think the other thing is just to be smart about what kind of risk you're putting yourself at if you have those health conditions. Um, crowded indoor spaces with poor ventilation pose the highest risk of COVID-19 transmission. So I would recommend that you minimize those exposures if at all pos possible over the next several weeks while we're experiencing this COVID-19 surge. Um, being outdoors is fine. Um, really minimal risk there, and being in large, well-ventilated spaces is also generally very safe. And then finally, if you are ill at this time, it's almost certainly going to be COVID-19. Um, as we have not yet seen an uptick in influenza activity, please remember that we do have therapies for COVID-19, and so if you do have a respiratory illness, get tested get in touch with your providers uh, because you may be a candidate for early initiation of medical therapy um, if you develop uh, COVID-19. I'll stop there. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Cernich. Uh, appreciate that update. And like you said, we're all tired of COVID-19, but we also need to make sure that we're aware of its risks and uh, how we should address that, especially as we go into the fall and winter. Um, so you heard a little bit about safety precautions and the importance of vaccinations, so now it's appropriate uh, that our next speaker, uh, Christy Esch, uh, will provide an update on when vaccines will be available and how you can get them. Christy. Great. Thank you, Abe. The CDC, or Centers for Disease Control, um, issued recommendations for getting the updated 2023-2024 COVID-19 vaccine earlier this month. Um, the previous versions of the vaccine are no longer available and cannot be given. The new vaccine um, has, a, has a few changes, so it's no longer considered or called a booster. It's a standalone vaccine for the 2023-2024 season. We can think of this similar to the yearly flu vaccine that, that we get. The COVID-19 variants circulating now are different from when the vaccine was updated last year, and this vaccine targets those more recent variants. Additionally, most Americans have had their most recent vaccine dose many months ago and therefore have reduced protection against COVID-19 illness. We know that receiving an updated 
or vaccine increases the immune response. And the goal of an increased immune response is to improve protection from becoming seriously ill from COVID-19. Due to the changes in the virus and that um, immunity that we may not have any, any longer, it's important to get this updated vaccine uh, as soon as it's available. These vaccines work in the same way as the previous versions. Um, and we will be receiving here at the Madison VA and all of our clinics the Moderna vaccine, which is the same manufacturer that we previously have received in use. Regardless of the type of vaccine that you received prior, you will be able to get this new Moderna 2023-2024 vaccine. One single dose of the updated vaccine is being recommended for all adults if it's been at least two months since receiving any previous COVID-19 vaccine or if you have never received the vaccine. And as a reminder, these are available here at the VA at no cost to veterans that are enrolled for healthcare. We also want to make sure you're aware that you can receive both the COVID-19 vaccine and the flu vaccine at the same visit. Um, so when, when you're here, um, your provider will be able to, to walk you through that as well. And the vaccine is recommended even if you have received or have um, had the COVID-19 infection. We don't have the vaccines available quite yet, but they should be available soon. We're starting to get that supply in shortly. Um, so when we have this vaccine and the VA releases their guidance for administration, we will let all of our veterans know. Um, we usually will post this on our VA Facebook page, on our Madison VA webpage, and we also use the Gov delivery system for uh, updates on availability and scheduling. So keep an eye out on those um, different, different areas. The, um, we anticipate the virus will continue to change in the future and we may need updated COVID-19 vaccines again. The timing and type of the future vaccines, of course, is unknown as the virus evolves. We also, as Abe mentioned, um, and Dr. Cernich, want to make sure you're aware that we are offering the flu vaccine to all veterans that is now available um, here at the main site and at all of the community-based outpatient clinics. The uh, flu vaccines are available by appointment at the outpatient clinics. Um, you can call your clinic to get that scheduled, or if you have a an appointment scheduled already in the next um, several weeks, they will be offering it to you when you're there already. Otherwise, if you're here at the main hospital, we do have uh, walk-ins available, which are by the travel office. So we invite you to stop on by and keep an eye out for information on the updated COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you very much, Christy. I really appreciate that update. Um, so, you know, just to recap, uh, flu vaccines are available uh, now uh, at our main hospital and clinics. So uh, if you're coming to the main hospital, uh, we have walk-ins available. Uh, if you're going to a clinic, please uh, reach out to your clinic um, and get information on when you can get your flu vaccine. <coughs> vaccine. And as Christy mentioned, we are uh, right now getting a supply of COVID vaccinations, so be on the lookout for when those will be broadly uh, available to you. Um, before we move to our next speaker, we want to get some feedback from all of you on the COVID and flu vaccine. So we have a couple of polling questions, and um, this is where we just try to get some feedback from the audience about uh, how they feel on specific subjects. So we'll ask a question, and you can respond by just hitting uh, the keypad on your phone to the corresponding number. So. Our first question is, with seasonal flu uh, campaign starting, are you, press one if you are definitely getting vaccinated for flu, two if you are likely to get vaccinated for flu, three if you are unlikely to get vaccinated for flu, and four if you are definitely not going to get vaccinated for flu. So one, definitely yes, two, likely, three, unlikely, and four, definitely not going to get vaccinated. So we see right now with uh, a lot of people weighing in, about 70% going to get vaccinated, uh, and uh, that's wonderful news. Uh, certainly encourage that. Thank you all for responding to that question. 
And we have one more, a very similar question about uh, the COVID vaccination. After hearing the presentation on COVID vaccinations, are you, one, definitely getting vaccinated for COVID, two, likely to get vaccinated for COVID, three, unlikely to get vaccinated for COVID, or four, definitely not going to get vaccinated for COVID? So again, one, definitely going to, two, likely, three, unlikely to get vaccinated, and four, definitely not going to get vaccinated for COVID. Okay, sweet. And again, thank you all for weighing in. It really helps us understand what the demand for these vaccines will be, and still uh, over 50% uh, definitely getting vaccinated for COVID. Um, so we appreciate that feedback, and uh, thank you all very much. Um, next up, we have an update on our travel and transportation programs. Liana Torres, our Chief Patient Administration here, the Chief P Patient Administration Service, is here to tell us about a new initiative. Liana. Thanks so much for having me here today. We all know how important travel reimbursement and transportation services are for veterans. As we managed through the COVID pandemic, we underwent a significant staff turnover in our travel department at the hospital. And those staff losses had a negative impact in our ability to process travel claims timely and reduce our ability to provide transportation services. It also severely limited our ability to answer veterans' phone calls. I want to report today that we are making a significant progress in catching up on travel claims and restoring reliable customer service. Recently, we established a new process for addressing your calls that should significantly improve the reliability of our response time and your confidence in our follow-up service. We are encouraging veterans who have concerns about travel claims or transportation requests to call the hospital at 608-256-1901, extension 11919. That is 608-256-1901, extension 11919. The extension will either be answered or provide you with an option to leave a message about travel reimbursement claims or a transportation request. Voice notes are reviewed daily, and we are committed to returning us, uh, veterans, all veterans' calls within two business days. We encourage you to follow the prompts in the messages and leave us with adequate information to act on your concerns. Our team is staffed to review these messages and act quickly to help make sure your concerns are answered promptly. One point of clarification we need to make is that the transportation line serves to handle requests for rights, it does not guarantee a right. Our team will follow up on all transportation requests, but you must receive confirmation of a scheduled right from us as clarification uh, your requested rights have been scheduled. As we move forward and add staff to our team, we expect our service to improve incrementally, but we are happy to report that this new line and two business day customer service is in place and that we're making every effort to meet it. Thank you for allowing me the time to update you today. Back to you, Abe. And thank you, Liana. So just to recap a little bit, um, that new travel line that we have available uh, does either get answered now or leads to a voicemail message tree where you can leave a concern about travel pay or a question about transportation. Um, and those um, uh, voice messages are reviewed daily and will be answered within two business days. So uh, the number again to call if you have either of those questions is 608-256-1901 and the extension is 11919. Um, so, um, you know, we, we have been making uh, significant efforts uh, to uh, improve the timeliness of payments and uh, to do everything we can to manage transportation needs for veterans. So appreciate, Liana, you and your team and all of the efforts you've made um, to improve. Um, and before we get to our Q&A, we have one last update. Um, and um, we have Stephanie Schilling with us, our Chief of Social Work, to talk to us about Suicide Prevention Awareness Month and the Compact Act. Stephanie. Good afternoon, everyone. September is Suicide Prevention Month. Veterans are often the first to help others, but it can sometimes be hard for veterans to accept or ask for help themselves. And we want all veterans to know that our William S. Middleton Memorial Veterans Hospital has services and resources to help veterans who are struggling. Although the veteran suicide rate meaningfully decreased in both 2019 and 2020, the suicide rate among veterans in 2020 was 
37% higher than non-veteran adults, according to the most recent available data from the 2020 National Veteran Suicide Prevention Annual Report. We know suicide is complex and stressful life events like, like transitions or struggles with housing can be risk factors. Our hospital offers resources to support veterans across a wide range of life challenges before these problems become overwhelming. Everyone can be a part of the solution by checking in with the veterans in their life and encouraging them to reach out if they need help. Visit va.gov slash r-e-a-c-h that's va.gov slash reach r-e-a-c-h to download and share social media content to spread the word. Also, we want to make sure all veterans are aware of the new eligibility for veterans in acute suicidal crisis care under the COMPACT Act. The COMPACT Act creates eligibility for emergency inpatient or crisis residential care for up to 30 days and outpatient care for up to 90 days for veterans who present to the VA or community emergency room in an acute suicidal crisis. Most veterans who are facing an acute suicidal crisis will be eligible for emergency care at either the VA or a community emergency room under the COMPACT Act. This act broadly widens eligibility for emergency acute suicidal care for veterans in an attempt to decrease the rate of veteran suicide. So in closing, please remember that if you or someone you know is having thoughts of suicide, contact the Veterans Crisis Line to receive free confidential support and crisis intervention. It's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Dial 988, then press one. You can also text 838-255. That's 838-255 or chat online at veterancrisisline.net slash chat. That's dialing 988, then pressing 1, or texting 838-255, or chatting online at veteranscrisisline.net slash chat. Please also remember that emergency acute suicidal crisis care is also more broadly available for veterans under this compact act. Thank you, Dave. back to you. Thank you so much, uh, Stephanie. Um, and those are, are words that we would repeat um, every month, but particularly in September during Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. Um, we've given you all uh, several updates, uh, and now it's time for us to answer your questions. And there are several uh, questions uh, in the queue. Um, and uh, the first one we have is from Tom in Rockford. Uh, Tom, if you're with us, uh, please let us know your question. Um, <clears throat> my question was uh, whether or not our VA checks are going to be in the mail in case of a government shutdown. Yeah. Tom, that's a very good question, and I know uh, whenever there's a, a threat of a government shutdown, that kind of question is on everyone's mind. Um, uh, from from uh, Right now, what we understand is that there would be no uh, delay in veterans' compensation and benefit checks uh, from a government shutdown. Uh, fortunately, that's one of the items that would be uh, shielded uh, from a shutdown. Similarly, uh, the VA uh, healthcare system is under an advanced appropriation. So there are only very, very limited impacts uh, that would occur to, uh, to VA healthcare operations, uh, none that would be uh, visible to veterans. So we will be providing care here, business as usual, um, in the event of a shutdown. Um, but hopefully that won't, that won't happen. Thank you very much for your question. 
All right. The next question we have is from William. William, uh, please go ahead with your question. Yes. I would like to find out why I'm having such a problem with uh, my medical uh, refill. I had it approved at Rockford by the doctor and by the associate. But when I called Madison, they said they, they do not recognize it. They have not had an approval. I wonder where the breakdown is between the local Rockford out uh, clinic and Madison. Why am I not getting my medicine I need for my uh, blindness? I, I mean, I, I, this is what I can't understand. The second one is, why can't I get my military medical records from Korea? Um, they say it, they lost them. How can you lose my medical records from Korea when I served there uh, and I got a couple operations? I cannot understand how my medical records can be lost. If you could answer those two, I would appreciate it. Hey, uh, it's Dr. Marsh. Hey, so I'll address the first one, the prescription. So, you know, we are one VA, so it should be that if something happened in Rockford, our people here in Madison should be able to see it. Um, we can get his name, right? So I can. Okay. I'm sorry, William. I'm, this is Jim from Public Affairs. At the end of the call, you're going to have an opportunity to, to leave a message. If you could make sure you leave your name and phone number on that, and we'll have somebody call you back rather than you announcing your yes. phone number for everybody to hear. Yeah, we don't want to we don't want to give your information out right now. But so so do that, and I can follow up on it and see because that that should not be happening. So I, I it sounds like there might be some things that need to be uh, addressed there. So happy to look into that regarding Korea. So. <clears throat> That's a more difficult question. So I know there was a fire in St. Louis and many records were lost. Uh, and it's really unfortunate. Usually if you're trying to make a claim and maybe that's what this is part of, um, they will give uh, more credence to whatever you're saying if the medical records aren't there. Um, and so uh, unfortunately I cannot answer that question why uh, the records from the 1950s uh, can't be found, unfortunately. Um, the If you're trying to make a claim, though, the Veterans Benefits Administration should do everything that they possibly can to find those records or tell you why they can't find them. Um, so that is also uh, a route to go. Okay. Well, I also went through the archives twice, That's maybe right. three times, and they can't even find them. So I, I'm kind of confused. Well, how they can get lost like that, but okay, I'll see what I can do. Yeah, so sorry, I don't have a better answer for you with that one. But William, please do leave a message with your information, and we'll make sure to have someone reach out to you so that we can look at the individual circumstances um, and and uh, get you some answers, okay? Or at least do our best to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, the next question we have is from George. Uh, George, go ahead with your question. Uh, yes, I was wondering, I've been trying to find out some information on the new Eastside Clinic, on when it's going to be open, and when they're going to start accepting patients, and what we have to do to transfer from one facility to that one. So, uh, George, I can I can begin by taking that, and others can jump in if they have uh, more information, but our Eastside uh, Clinic is uh, under construction, and construction is moving along really well. Um, we expect the construction part of it to be complete in the April-May timeframe, and we still are planning for activation of that clinic uh, in the June-July timeframe. So um, by this time next year, for certain, uh, the East Clinic will be open, um, and uh, we'll look forward to uh, providing updates uh, to veterans um, about our progress in the coming months. Um, regarding your question uh, about uh, when to transfer, I know one of the um, uh, actions of our East Clinic activation team is really thinking through the process of reaching out to veterans to provide them with information about their options for either retaining care at West or moving their care to East. So we will have a communications uh, plan uh, that we will execute um, in order to kind of reach out and uh, provide um, of all of the veterans with options for what 
um, what they can do to transfer their care to East or retain it at West. But we're really excited about the prospect of that clinic opening, um, and we do expect it uh, to be uh, open and providing uh, services in the June-July time frame, 2024. All right. Um, the next question we have is from Mark. Uh, Mark, please join us and share your question. Yes, sir. Thank you. My question is, I'm a veteran in the Madison area, and I'm wondering, does the VA in in the Madison campus offer any support groups for spouses of veterans, particular people like me that suffer from PTSD and bipolar too? Hi, Mark. This is Stephanie from Social Work. Thanks for your question. Uh, we do You're offer. Welcome. Yeah. <laughs> We do offer a variety of different support groups. So I think in order to match you or your spouse or your caregiver with the appropriate um, support group, I'd like you to call the social work office and we can get you hooked up with different resources. And so I'm gonna give you the phone number and other people are gonna get it as well so you can, <laughs> the other folks can call. It's 608. 280-7085. That's 608-280-7085. And then one other thing that I'll mention is we have a very robust caregiver support program. That program has two different uh, sub programs under it. One is for um, highly service connected veterans who have caregivers who might benefit from a stipend. That's our stipend program. And then the other one is for general caregivers. And so I want to make sure everyone understands that if you're a caregiver for a veteran or you're a veteran caregiver, certainly uh, get a hold of us and we can make uh, a referral to our caregiver support program. I also have the 1-800 caregiver support national line and that is 1-855-260-3274. That's 855-260-3274. Does that answer your question, Mark? Thank you very much, ma'am. Take care. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, our next question is from James in Rockford. Uh, James, please join us. Yes, this is uh, James in Rockford. Uh, back in June, I had a kidney transplant in Heinz VA. In, su in subsequent care, I've submitted nine travel claims, and I've heard nothing back yet. I wonder if you could help me. Hey, good afternoon, James. My name is Kent Hall. Um, I represent the travel office here at the Madison VA. Um, when it comes to the transplant um, travel reimbursement, it does require a little bit of collaboration between two different facilities. Usually, if we're the facility sitting you down to um, Heinz, we're the ones paying for that transportation. However, if you're in the area and you're receiving um, care from Heinz, they're responsible. But here at the Madison VA, we're, we're pretty much caught up to around June when it comes to our online uh, submitted uh, travel reimbursements and then a little bit more recent for our paper claims. However, if we do find a situation where yours was not taken care of in an appropriate manner, we do want you to send a message uh, or leave a message after this call so that when we can follow up, we will gladly look at your claim and see if there's uh, any individual situation that might have prevented it from being visible or even paid in a timely manner. Okay, thank you. And just remember also um, that we have uh, that number that I mentioned in the beginning, um, 608-256. 1901 extension 11919. Um, that's a number that we're encouraging all veterans that have questions about travel pay uh, to call. 
And just as a reminder, it intentionally has a voicemail there that we review every day. So if we're not able to answer the phone because that has been a busy department, um, we are committed to returning those calls within two days. So if you leave us information about the travel episode you're concerned about, um, your name and your contact information, our staff will uh, research your claim and get back to you. So that's that's something that I think everyone, uh, we really want to make sure everyone understands um, so that you know that we're um, being attentive to and following through um, on those questions. Um, the next question we have is from John. Uh, John, please go ahead with your question. Yes, what is the number or the, or the section or people I talk to so I can evaluate whether I should switch my care from like Dean Clinic to the VA? You know, financially, uh, with my spouse, where I could have some conversation with somebody to uh, inform me about that. Well, first, before I let Stephanie answer this question, I'm really happy you're considering uh, us as your health care provider. But, uh, Stephanie, details? Yeah, hi, John. Uh, that's a very good question and a question that we get all of the time. Uh, we see a lot of folks who have had income changes, perhaps they've um, retired, maybe they have switched jobs and they don't have access to private insurance anymore. And they want to, to know what the benefits are of um, staying with a private insurance company versus coming to the VA, or should they do both? And social work really has uh, a good handle on that. We give that presentation to folks a lot. So again, I'd ask you to call the social work office and we, we can get you hooked up with uh, one of our primary care social workers who can answer that. So I'll give that number out again. It's 608-280-7085. And then if there's any questions that we don't uh, answer or can't answer. Sometimes we uh, ask eligibility and they help us out too. But we'll get you uh, set up and answer your questions. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, appreciate the response to that question. Uh, the next question we have is from Kathy uh, from Columbus. Kathy, please join us. Hello. I yep, am wondering Okay, I'm just wondering why MRIs are so far back or taking so long to get one done. Um, my husband's had one ordered for a week and a half, two weeks, and he can't even get in until December. And I'm curious what is being done to help move that along where it's not taking so long. Yes, yeah, so, uh, Kathy, uh, thank you so much for your question, and nothing is more frustrating than those waits. Um, so we are addressing that. There's just a big demand right now, uh, and we are currently working on uh, operationalizing our mobile MRI, so bringing in an extra uh, MRI. Uh, it's a basically a, a big uh, uh, trailer comes in with the MRI machine and with technicians, and it's going to allow us to really go after those, uh, uh, those people that have been waiting. Um, and we hope that that will be up and running by uh, January. In the meantime, we're also sending people into the community uh, for uh, those uh, more urgent MRIs. Uh, and so that's something, you know, to, if you have a discussion with the primary provider or whoever ordered it, they can also send that into the community for community care is another possibility. So I am sorry for that, uh, and we are uh, addressing that. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Kathy, and thank you, Dr. Marsh. Um, the next question we have is from Gilkey. Gilkey, you have a question. Uh, yes, um, I am a veteran service officer and I have a VAC office in Ogle. And we wanted to know, are we, so we give rights to veterans. Are we supposed to report to VA the riders we are giving rights to? And if so, where do we fax that to? Good afternoon, Gilkey. So we do appreciate if we get information about the riders. Um, part of the reason why it's transparency, if we bring a veteran in, we want to make sure that they're not filing for mileage reimbursement, but also we also want to account for the veteran's rides home. 
Now, it's been the experience in the past whenever we do have a writer's list from an outside source that they do provide that information to our office directly or they email us uh, at, um, I think the, the email is madvhatravelclerk at va.gov and that would send an email to our office. And so if you want to provide a writer's list there, that would help out. Um, also, again, the phone number, which is provided earlier, 608-256-1901, extension 11919. Um, that'll get you to someone inside the travel office or be able to leave a voicemail, and if you want to give us the writer list, that works out uh, in our favor and the veterans' favors. But it was M A D V H A T R A V E L C L E R K S. I missed the end. Uh, at uh, V A dot gov. F V A. Oh, the okay. And let's see. Just give me that. Okay, and I just guess. make sure that the anytime you provide a link. Uh, that you spell it out just because we you mentioned a few links that we didn't I didn't hear the ending I couldn't even tell what it was even though you repeated it a few times so the other one was veterans crisis line uh, dot net dot check uh, backslash chat oh back so net backslash chat backslash chat c h a t And then, okay. Gilkey, I, we, one, we want to thank you for your efforts to provide rides to veterans because it's an enormously helpful service. But if you do have a question, you could also just reach out. Uh, do call because that would be a conversation that any of our tribal <laughs> folks would be happy to have with you and just make sure that we're sorting out all the specifics together. But thank, thank you Perfect. very much for providing service to veterans from Northern Illinois. It's much appreciated. All right, uh, the next question we have is from Pete in Monroe. Pete, uh, please join us. Uh, yes, it's Pete McGrath. I'm calling from Monroe, Wisconsin. I have a question on that COVID vaccination. The last time we had one, they said that was it, and we wouldn't have to take shots anymore. Now they come up with the so-called new strain of COVID with another standalone shot. Why do we need the uh, booster? If you could answer that, I would appreciate it. Hi, Steve. Thanks for the question. This is Christy. Um, so, like Dr. Cernich talked about a little bit earlier, the COVID-19 virus has, has continued to change. Um, and we know that getting these new vaccines has been really helpful in preventing that really serious or severe illness, the, the type that lands people in the hospital or, or worse. Um, and so this is a new vaccine to help combat those new um, strains that, that we're seeing to prevent that serious illness. So, I, I would anticipate, just like flu, as the years go by, we will continue to see um, new COVID-19 vaccines each year. So instead of coming in every fall just for your flu vaccine, I'm, I'm thinking that every fall it will be a flu and a COVID vaccine. Good question. Yeah, at least now it looks like it might be a little bit more predictable, right. if nothing mm -hmm. else. All right, uh, the next question we have uh, is from Monroe, who has a question about the caregiver program. Go ahead, Monroe. How is everybody today? I, I want to say thank you for everybody on the panel for even having this um, to give veterans a chance to, you know, hear our voice and also hear other veterans, you know, to think about questions that maybe we didn't even think about. Um, so thank you all. My question is um, regarding the caregiver program, and it is um, concerning the process of becoming a caregiver. Um, and the question is, is it always going to remain that when you have a scheduled video meeting with yourself and the, and the person that you're giving care to, will it always be that you have to be at home? Because my situation was um, I, I was a caregiver for my, my stepfather, who was uh, also a veteran from uh, about, I want to say, 
March of 2021, I'm sorry, March of 2020 up until um, January of uh, 2022 when he um, unfortunately passed on. But I um, started to uh, attempt to become a caregiver sometime in in uh, 2021. But he was back and forth in a hospital or a nursing home like for a week here and there. And since the meetings had to be at home, from what I understood, I was denied, um, you know, being a caregiver. But, you know, indeed, I, I was that caregiver, you know. And I'm not you know, wasn't expecting anything for that because we should be looking out for each other. But the process just seemed to be very difficult because I completed so many meetings, but then it, I couldn't, I think it's three months that you have to have it all done by. But since he was back and forth, I, I was, um, wasn't was able to get maybe that last meeting in. So is it always going to be that way where if uh, the person you're giving care to was in the hospital when you have a scheduled meeting um, that you have to reschedule it or um, is it just going to remain the way it is? Hi, Monroe. This is Stephanie from Social Work again. Um, first, I really want to thank you for caring for your stepfather and um, our deepest sympathies on his passing. Um, it's, it's great uh, that you stepped up and helped us take care of our uh, veterans. So thank you for that. Getting on to your question, the, the caregiver program, like I said before, it has two different uh, sub-programs, and so I think the one you're referencing is the paid program where caregivers can get a stipend for uh, providing care for their, their veteran. And so that one does have a lot more rules and regulations to it um, than the general caregiver program. Um, so you're, you're correct in saying that um, a veteran has to be able to be maintained uh, for a certain amount of time outside of a hospital or nursing home and that we wouldn't uh, necessarily pay for a caregiver if a person uh, unfortunately had to, to move to the nursing home. And so those requirements um, are put into place by Congress and it's, our goal is to operationalize that and so there are some pretty strict timelines. So I, I do think that uh, you probably unfortunately did get stuck in that timeline system and perhaps ran out of days. But I want everyone to know if, if that situation happens to you, you can always call in and ask for an appeal or a redecision. The caregiver program, um, you know, things change, situations change. So if you're not eligible at one point, you, you might be at a different point. So just keep us in mind, and um, I will give you that 1-800 number again, just so the crowd has it. It's 855-260-3274. And again, Monroe, thank you for um, helping us care for our veterans. Thank you. Thank you as well. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you, Monroe. Uh, the next uh, question is from Rob. Uh, Rob, please uh, let us know what your question is. Uh, I'm receiving pay for permanent leave paid attendance and house pay, and I'm wondering if I'm eligible for the vet director's home care to resume. Rob, we were having a little trouble hearing you. Can you repeat your question, please? And maybe stay, be a little closer to your mic. You bet. All right. I'm receiving the enhanced pay for the permanent need aid and attendance, and I'm wondering if I'm eligible for veteran-directed home care through community care. Thanks for your question, Rob. It's Stephanie and Ben. Um, so our veteran-directed care program is run out of our community care uh, section that has social workers in it. So if you want to um, call us at the social work office, we can get you to talking to a social worker who can determine whether you're eligible for veteran-directed care or medical foster home or um, homemaker home health and all of those different services that, that we have to support um, eligible veterans in, in their homes so that we can keep them out of the 
hospital and the nursing home. So our social work number again is uh, 608-280-7085. And we'll get you hooked up. Okay. Thanks, Rob. I am in Wausau. Does that still apply? You're in Boston? No, Boston. Oh, Boston. <laughs> <laughs> like Boston, wow, we, we've got a huge crush. <laughs> um, you know what? You know what? You call us and we'll get you hooked up with uh, the Toma VA folks because that's probably yeah. in their service. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right, everybody. I think we have one more question. Uh, time for one more question and from Susan. Susan, you have another question about travel, and I know there's been a lot of interest in that. So, Susan, please yes. go ahead with your um, question. Sure. I, I have been treated at Madison. Wonderful wonderful hospital. I can't say enough good things about the care I've received. Um, but I'm driving from Toma. There were occasions when I would have four or five appointments within several days of each other. Um, I'd file the travel claim, understand, you know, staff shortages and whatever. But when the payment hits my bank, the only date I have is when it hits the bank. To try and determine if I've been paid for a claim, I have no way of linking the payment to a specific claim date. And it's very difficult to determine, you know, have I been overpaid? Did I get paid for this or whatever? Um, you know, on active duty travel pay, I got a, you know, a, a statement of of what was paid and what date. Um, now, not that I want anybody to put any more paperwork in the mill, but is there any way to link in the claim details? You know, when I look on my healthy vet, all I can see is that the claim was paid and the date of the appointment. It and and the, you know, I, so I have no way of knowing, especially since the amounts are usually the same. It's it's very difficult, and you know I did go in in person and and trying to, um, you know they they could pull out a, a printout, but it didn't necessarily match my bank statement. So Susan, so it, um, it was, we, we only have a very short time left, so I'm going to let Kent begin to answer your question, and then just encourage you if you have follow up questions to get back in touch with our travel office. But Kent, go ahead. Hey Susan. Um, so I do understand that you may receive a payment at one time. How it uh, works on our end, once we authorize the payment and it's submitted to our finance office, they will take the multiple uh, submissions and then authorize that payment and it may go in at one time. So I know from your end, like you said, you're receiving one payment. On our end, we can see multiple payments going out, but the only way that we can actually decipher uh, each dollar amount for each payment is if you do contact the travel office, we should be able to give you a, a, tra a tracing number, the payment date, um, and hopefully that can kind of clear up the question that you may have. Uh, any further questions you may have to go to the finance office, but please contact us in the travel office at 608-256-1901, uh, extension 11919, and uh, we should be able to help you out there. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Kent. Appreciate it. Um, and to all the veterans who stuck on the line, uh, hundreds of you, uh, we really appreciate your time. Uh, we appreciate the very many questions we have. We do uh, log all of the questions. Uh, and um, if you do have something that you need to follow up on, we encourage you to call us back. If your question didn't get answered, uh, we'll, we'll work on trying to get responses to all of you. Um, but this is a wonderful way for us to connect with all of you. We really appreciate your time and attention today and all of the great questions. Uh, wish everybody a happy fall. Stay safe out there. Um, and uh, we will talk, we will have another one of these next quarter. So thanks very much for your time today.